Tom. Please enter. Muted. Scott Demore suggested a little pancake restaurant. I said no, I didn't need. I was informed that they served sirloin tips at this this place, which would be like someone telling you they serve caviar at Burger King. You know, you'd be a little bit skeptical. And uh, but uh, Scott, uh, Scott and Cam and yourself uh, took me to this lovely establishment, and I have to say, well, it was not uh, filet mignon. It was. Uh, it was fairly good. It wasn't the uh, Nobu experience I had in Japan with Jericho, but it was very close. Cool. Right, I'm going to put it over. Let it uh, step below. Yeah, I, I feel there's probably some undigested sirloin tips uh, in my colon for the next 20 years. But other than that, it was great. Thank you, Rod. Scott, I'm not really sure a good follow-up question for you on that. Uh, perhaps you can enlighten us on what you saw, the highlight of yesterday's uh, impact was. Uh, you know, to me, the highlight was just... Uh, Getting people in here, seeing uh, seeing some old faces return, seeing uh, seeing here for a new year and excited, and uh, just good to see the the team coming together and getting ready to work in a positive direction. I thought uh, I thought we had pretty positive vibes and a good feeling, and it's, you know when a whole group of people work together in one direction, uh, you know good things happen. All right, media, we will open it up for questions for two thirds of our executive team here, and uh, please, you have a question, star six, and identify yourself and your media outlet. Hey, this is John with Impact. Q&A session has started. To ask your question, please press star six. Also, please, uh, if you have a question for one or the other, or if you want both of them to answer it, uh, let us know. Hi, both. Um, hope, you, hope you're well and enjoying the, uh, the Orlando Sun. Um, this is Tony from Steelchair Magazine. Um, just had a question in, in regards to um, announcing Austin Aries was was your champion. Obviously the tapings are happening at the moment. And in in previous times at Impact, stuff like that hadn't been announced. What what was the thinking behind that and is that part of the new regime? Uh Scott here. I mean I think I think part of that was uh certainly when uh coming in here we're looking to uh, tackle some things in some different ways and and, uh, you know, a lot of times over the years, uh, things have been reported everywhere else other than by us. So it's certainly something that's new that we're trying. And uh, we're going to uh, we're going to monitor it, see how it works, see what the response is to it. And, uh, you know, like everything else under here, we're just uh, getting our feet wet. And it's going to be a feeling out process. And we'll, uh, we'll find uh, what we feel is the right path and what's working best. And we'll, uh, you know, move forward in that direction. That's great. Thanks. Hey guys, uh, Vijay from Sports Kira here. So I have a question for both of you. Uh, so when I last spoke to Scott, I uh, had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Scott. He mentioned that uh, performers from Impact Wrestling may now carry their IP outside the company. And uh, recently we saw a picture of Ed Nordholm and Matt Hardy on Twitter shaking hands. Uh, did the two of you have something to do with that? Uh, it's Scott again here. Everything that we do here, uh, you know, we have a management team in place with Ed Nordholm, uh, Don, and myself. And, you know, what we try to do is we try to make decisions as a group. As you're aware from our conversation and from many other sources, we've, uh, we've made a pretty drastic change in how we handle the IP as we want to empower the wrestlers to be able to, to, to feel that they – they have ownership of that IP, and they have the comfort of knowing that they'll always be able to use it. So, yeah, we sat down as a group, and uh, it's important that uh, that uh, all wrestlers, past and present, know that that right is available to them, and uh, that respect and that uh, relationship is available to everybody, including Matt Hardy, who's a wonderful talent who's had a great history here with his company. So it was great that we'll be able to put that to bed and move forward and uh, have a great relationship with uh with Matt and the Hardy family like we have for many, many years, and we wish them the ultimate success, um, you know, in their great war, wherever it shall take them. 
Hi, this is BQ from the Impact Lounge. Um, this question is for either of you, whoever would like to answer it. Other companies have been making some pretty big moves recently regarding their women's division, making it more exciting. Even though the Impact Knockouts have technically implemented many of these concepts first, have you been working on any ideas to take the Knockouts to that next level? And specifically, could we see the return of the Knockouts tag team title? Thank you. Uh, it's Scott here. Uh, obviously, the knockouts are a very uh, rich part of our history here, and uh, it's something that I fear, feel very strongly about, as I was myself and Dutch Mantel were kind of the team that oversaw the launching of the knockouts division. And as you see, we're starting to bring in uh, some additional knockouts. You'll also be hearing some things in the future about us going out and looking at scouting events to scout future knockouts, and certainly... Uh, it's very important that we find fresh talent, both both uh, female and male, of course, and we do look forward to uh, having the knockouts be a continue to be and grow to be even more a big part of uh, Impact Wrestling. Hey, this is John from ImpactAsylum.net. Uh, my question is for Don. First of all, Don, welcome back. Uh, my question is, you know, you've mentioned and name drop Japan. You've name-dropped Chris Jericho since being on this call. What everybody really wants to know is, what's the state of the relationship with Impact Wrestling and New Japan? Do you see partnerships on the horizon? And what's the chance of maybe making it rain in 2018? Um, yes, well, I'll be, I'll be careful. Not, I don't think I mean, maybe I'll name-drop Hulk Hogan as well. <laughs> but, so let's get a rain <laughs> started. <laughs> um, no, uh, well, you know, I think that we as uh, as a new organization, I say new because it's a new management, and there very much is a new attitude here. Our attitude is that the days of thinking from a uh, insular perspective, from a territorial perspective, that that's old school thinking, uh, very much like how we moved on the IP protection. Uh, we're moving away from those institutionalized old school paradigms. Uh, and moving towards a, a future where um, you have to embrace what's going on in the business. And what's going on in the business is, to an incre increasing extent, never before seen in the, in the history of the business, the power is in the hands of the wrestlers. They have social media. They have T-shirt stores. They have the ability to promote themselves in a way that guys like me who came up in the 90s never could. So I think you have to either get on the steamroller or you can stand in front of it. Uh, we prefer to be on top of the steamroller on this, and that means we're very open uh, to working with anyone, not just New Japan, but also Ring of Honor uh, and, and any other promotion. I mean, I think you have to be, none of us are Vince McMahon, and I think that people who try to be Vince McMahon are going to fail miserably. So there's enough business for everyone that we can all work together and do well, and again, whether that's you know, working with, with, uh, with any of the promotions in the U.S., Mexico, Europe. We're open to all of that, not just New Japan. People talk about New Japan because of Kenny Omega, and I get it, and because I'm there. But when I'm there, I'm not there as executive vice president of Impact Wrestling. When I'm there, I'm there as the color commentator, period. I don't have the talent, and I don't, I don't talk that kind of business. They're paying me to, to be the best color commentator in the industry, and that's what I do. Hi guys, it's Tony again from Steelchair. Sorry if I'm jumping on in front of anyone. But um, just a quick question. In, in regards to the, the tapings, um, is there a plan to go back to Ottawa after the success you guys had there? Or is, is the plan now to, to go back to Orlando and remain there? It's probably easier for both of you to go back to Ottawa, to be honest. But uh, interested in your thoughts. Uh, I'm sorry, Scott. Would you, would, uh, your question was, are we going to be continuing to tape out of Orlando? Was that the question? Correct, yeah. Or if there was any plans to go back to, to Canada. Well, there's, I mean, we're certainly, like we said, I mean, and it, you know, I don't want to keep making it sound like we're punting down the road, but we're, we literally sit here on day 11, um, you know, in office, and we uh, were evaluating lots of things. We've had a wonderful relationship with Universal Studios over the years. But uh, we do feel strongly that it's important that in multiple ways we get out in front of wrestling fans 
uh, in, in, in the U.S. and hopefully around the world. And so I certainly think that there is a very good uh, chance that you'll see us building uh, again in Canada and also probably other U.S. locations. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that we won't return to, to Universal Studios Orlando because, like I said, we have had a great rapport, but we will be getting out there both with, with live events and with, uh, with uh, you know, the Twitch deal announced and, co and providing content for, for Twitch and the other digital platforms like with our GWN offering. We're going to be getting out there doing events and getting content out to people in, in so many different ways, which is a great part of being in, you know, 2018 is all the different delivery systems that are out there. But certainly, even our flagship impact, uh, I would expect to see it, you know, in 2018, being being filmed in other locations as well. Thank you. Uh, hello, gentlemen. David Dunn here with the New Zealand uh, Pro Wrestling Informer. Uh, you just touched on it then, Scott, so I guess I'll direct my question to you. Um, what is this Twitch deal you mentioned? I have missed the news of that, saw the picture of the Twitch logo on the ring apron. Uh, what's the relationship uh, between Twitch and Impact Pro Wrestling? Uh, well, I mean, as you saw, I mean, Twitch is, is, uh, is, is getting into the wrestling business. They've been doing, <coughs> excuse me, they've been doing things with, uh, with Tommy Dreamer and House of Hardcore, which is a great organization. You'll also be seeing a, uh, an impact channel on Twitch where we'll be providing both uh, historical content like library content as well as original programming. And not just wrestling content, but, uh, but also other things where you get to see behind that fourth wall and you get to see the, the wrestlers in, uh, in a non-studio setting, not just seeing them at the arena, not just seeing them backstage on a set, but you're getting to see a you know peek at their personal lives and different uh, different aspects of their lives because that's certainly something that uh, that fans are interested in. So this is a pretty exciting opportunity for us. Uh, Twitch is a is a is a is a, is a great uh, company. It's uh, certainly out there on the cutting edge, and we'll be providing, like I said, uh, round the clock content, which would be a combination, obviously, of mainly library uh, content um, that we have, and we have a great library here. And then also uh, providing them events that will be exclusive to Twitch, maybe with some, you know, like some live events, and then also filmed, uh, uh, you know, taped events and, and some live events with talent that will, like I said, take you into their homes and into different aspects of their lives so you can get to know them better. Hi there, this is uh, Zach McGibbon from the Hannibal TV YouTube channel. I was just wondering, uh, why did you go back to the four sides uh, as compared to the six-sided ring? Um, when, uh, I think when Scott and I first started talking about it, with both of us having been former professional wrestlers, um, we both, I think, uh, we both shared the view that primary importance is, is um, creating an environment where the talent can flourish um, from, from top to bottom. And one of the things I think is, is the ring. Um, from all the feedback that I've certainly ever gotten, talent prefers the four-sided ring. It's a better ring to bump in. It's a better ring to do spots, hit the ropes, whatever. Um, so we wanted, and, and I, I felt like the only argument that I'd ever heard for six sides was that it's different. And my comment to Scott at the time uh, was, well, it would be different to have a ring with no ropes, but no one would do that. So it's like, let's not be too cute by half. This is professional wrestling. Professional wrestling rings have four sides. Let's create an environment where the talent can flourish. And, you know, not that this is why we made the decision, but the Twitter feedback that I got, personally at least, I think Scott would probably echo this, you know, the, the switching the ring from six to four sides was a very common tweet that I would get in terms of people offering free advice. So, um, so I guess we took the advice. Uh, we got a uh, email question from Lee Mead of Scotland's Live Radio. The key feature of Impact in recent months has been the inclusion of individual matches from other worldwide promotions. Has the inclusion of these matches purely been to highlight the availability of the organizations on the Global Wrestling Network, or will these continue and the, uh, an impact moving forward? Well, I 
think that it's it certainly proved that those those segments have been uh, something that can uh, can add another dimension to the product. Uh, and you know, we're always looking at, uh, at different ways to to tackle things differently. Uh, the, some of the promotions you've seen on there are uh, promotions that have content or will have content shortly available on the Global Wrestling Network, but uh, that, that's not a requirement to do so. You'll be seeing um, content from, from other, other providers, other promotions that you know, we're, we're happy to work with. It's not you, you, you know, hey, if you want to work with us, you need to give us your content uh, you know, or, or license your content to us for the, uh, for the app. Uh, it's basically a chance for us to get out there in other settings. It helps uh, it helps us get out to other places and in front of other wrestling fans. And it also provides some exposure for uh, for the other companies, the, the companies that we'll work with in doing that, and get our talent out in different settings and doing things that we can integrate into our show. So certainly, I see it uh, having a part of uh, being a part of Impact Wrestling going forward, and it's not just exclusive to to our partnership promotions, it's open and out there. We want to have a, a pretty open, open door policy, and if there's a way that we can work with other groups that is mutually beneficial, then uh, we're happy and excited to explore that. If you'd like to ask a question, your request has been received. Just had a question regarding some of the um, rumored contracts that seem to be coming up. To, to the end of their ever at the end of this year, the likes of Lashley, EC3, and Eddie Edwards. Um, what are your thoughts on retaining those guys? And is that going to be the policy going forward? Or are we going to be looking to bring new talent in? I'm sorry, but I need you to repeat that question. Yeah, sorry. It was it was in regards to the um, the rumor contract expiries for the likes of EC3, Lashley, and, and Eddie Edwards that, that are rumored to, to be coming up shortly. Um, just whether or not, I mean, the focus is going to be retaining those guys, or are you going to be equally looking at bringing in new guys? Uh, I think there's always got to be a combination of uh, established talent here at Impact as well as. Uh, as well as also uh, an, an influx of new talent, and that's not something that's unique to impact in, in this industry and really enters any sports or entertainment uh, form. You always need to have a flux. I mean, that brings a freshness to it. We obviously, uh, you know, value greatly our legacy talent and talent that has a rich history here. But this is a business where sometimes you work together and sometimes you part ways. And ultimately, as we've seen throughout history, oftentimes you come back to work together again. So we, we do have somewhat of a fluid idea of how talent can move in a new world that provides so many freedoms. And uh, we certainly always look to continue to work with talent so that we can, uh, we can have a situation where, it's, uh, where they're comfortable and their best interest to stay here. And we feel that it's uh, the company's best interest and we can continue to uh, work together. When there's times come that uh, it's time to part ways and say, see you down the road, then we'll, we'll uh, work with that talent collaboratively the same way as we do throughout their entire run on, uh, on how to uh, move on so they can move on to the next stage of their uh, career and we can move on and introduce uh, a new talent that gets an opportunity to have a platform to build their own brand. Hey guys, this is Duran Romina with Inroad.com. Uh, this question is for Don. Uh, will you have a similar role to Jimmy Jacobs on Impact, where you will work both behind the scenes as well as an on-air role of some kind? Sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah, sorry about that. Um, I was just curious as to whether you're going to have a role similar to Jimmy Jacobs on Impact, where you're going to be working both behind the scenes as well as have an on-air role of some kind? So, sorry, your question is, Will Jimmy Jacobs be working both on air and behind the scenes? Well, if you will have a similar role to Jimmy Jacobs. Oh, will I have that? Yes. Oh, um, well, well, given that uh, most of the feedback I've gotten from fans is, please don't put yourselves on television. <laughs> I don't know, maybe Scott and I never did a good job on TV. No one wants to see it. I have no plans to be in front of a camera. Um, a lot of people speculated that I might revitalize the kind of uh, – uh, ECW Network, Mr. McMahon-esque gimmick, uh, authority figure thing, 
one of the things I firmly believe coming in is that the authority figure character in wrestling is overdone. Uh, I, I thought it was overdone when I came here in 03 and when they had me do it. Um, but people have been doing it for 13 years after. So um, I will not be doing that. Um, you know, it, I just don't think, I think uh, Scott and I both um, like to think that we're, we're good performers in front of the camera, but we're, we're, trust me, we're busy enough dealing with everything else uh, to do that. I, you know, I also found, I think Scott would probably echo it, when I promoted my own shows, small as they were, when I was uh, talent and booking the show and being involved in every aspect, something suffers, either your behind the scenes stuff or your on camera. So I don't think that's at all. I think that's suboptimal. So um, you won't be seeing me on TV, at least until they perfect hair transplant surgery. That was a joke, by the way. You can laugh. It's okay. Hey, Scott and Don. Andre Corbeil coming to you from Canada's wrestling capital, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, with a question for each of you. Now, Scott, I haven't had the pleasure of talking to you since I interviewed you for Wrestle Kingdom 9, and I have an interesting question. Hopefully you guys can uh, share regarding Twitch. Now, I worked for the Hearts up here for their wrestling promotion, and I know that you do not put anything on the skirt unless there's some sort of deal going on there or mixed promotion or whatnot. So could Scott, could you please... Uh, divulge some information in that regard? Well, I mean, I think I kind of covered it earlier in the call. Uh, you know, Twitch is a, is, a, is, a, is a great new platform out there, deliver, delivering content to fans all over the world, and we're excited to be a part of that, uh, that system. You've seen it with House of Hardcore. Um, we're now excited to, be, uh, to, to have an opportunity to, uh, to be part of the, you know, the, uh, the Twitchverse and be out there and part of that in another way to not just deliver wrestling content, but also a behind-the-scenes, uh, inside-the-lives-of look at uh, many of our talent. And I know that the caller meant to say that Winnipeg was the wrestling capital of the world, not Calgary. Uh, and if you, any further evidence is necessary, I would just mention the Mount Rushmore of wrestling in Winnipeg, Roddy Piper, Chris Jericho, Kenny Omega, and the great one himself, yours truly. Thank you very much. Thank of course, you. he does work for the heart, Reason- so we have to say I hear your argument there, Don, but uh, we'll respectfully disagree in that regard. Now, how has it been so far? How has it been so far since your return? It's been a number of years, and I think all of us are happy to see you back. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's really, you know what's great is being around the boys, and that's the part about the business that I miss. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in many respects, everything I've done in the business up till this point has kind of been preparing me for, for a role like this. And so um, it just feels really good to be at the steep learning curve. I haven't been around a television um, taping situation in many years, so I'm kind of drinking from the fire hose, as they like to say. Uh, but, you know, kind of getting my feet underneath me. And, um, you know, I, I love interacting with the talent, and we've got some great talent here and uh, great people working in the office. So. It's uh, it's a it's an intensive experience, learning experience, but I'm having fun. Hi guys, this is Nick Hausman with WrestleZone.com, and uh, I was wondering, um, what from the past uh, with Impact Wrestling, do you think that we're not going to see any more of now that you guys uh, have some control? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't catch that. Sure, sure. Uh, I just wanted to know, you know, now that you guys are in there, Impact has such a long history. What from the past in Impact do you think we're not going to see any more of now that you guys have some control? What are, what are we not going to see? Yeah, what will fans not be seeing that will be different from the Impact product? What from the past in Impact that we saw quite a bit do you think we'll not see any more with you guys in control? Uh, I mean, I guess that's an interesting question, as most of the questions have been uh, directed at what we will, what, what they will see. Um, I think what, uh, what what you won't see is decisions made for anything other than what uh, we as a group feel is best for the company. 
Um, you won't see our talent put in a situation where they where they feel like they're treated as assets and not human beings. Uh, you won't see a situation where there's a hierarchy that isn't open to to uh, to uh, to input and uh, creative collaboration. And uh, I have to honestly put an asterisk there and say that in uh, some of my time in TNA, I saw all those things um, you know that I mentioned not happening not happen, and I saw a great environment. But as you as you look for what not to see, then uh, I think for you, you, you not to see an authority figure both uh, in front of the camera or behind the ring that tries to run things unilaterally. Hey guys, this is Graham Romino with Edinburgh.com again. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors in regards to pay-per-views coming back, such as lockdown in a few months. Anything else you can offer on lockdown and other pay-per-views possibly being brought back to the pay-per-view schedule in 2018? We're currently evaluating our, our pay-per-view schedule, and uh, certainly in a, a world with that's ever-changing when it comes to content delivery, um, the pay-per-view business has, has changed, as there's been so many other ways now for people to, uh, to, to receive uh, content and to follow a product that they're passionate about. Uh, but pay-per-view will be an area of business that we will continue to, to look at and to grow. It's, uh, it's currently under evaluation. And we're excited to get back out there in April uh, with a live pay-per-view in front of a, in front of a great crowd. And there'll be a lot of announcements coming about that uh, shortly. Scott, that's a, we'll follow that up with a email question from Gurr of uh, Real Sports. What's your honest opinion of the one-night-only pay-per-views? And his next question, I think he just answered, is lockdown coming back to the live pay-per-view? Well, like I said, the uh, the pay-per-view system uh, that, we, that is, we currently have is under review, um, and it's under review from, from top to bottom. And how we handle things, we'll be we'll be coming out of these tapings and going right into corporate meetings where the path will be set on a lot of those things. Um, the one night only uh, concept is an interesting one. I think we've maybe got some ways to look at it and do it uh, in some uh, some different ways uh, than it's been done in the past. In part of our uh, our plans to expand and uh, and and have events in in different parts of the country and hopefully eventually the world. And one night only can certainly play a valuable role in that uh, in that repositioning growth of the company. You may now ask your question. Hey guys, Ryan Bowman from thegorillaposition.com. <clears throat> Scott, uh, you've helped a lot of, launch a lot of careers up with Border City Wrestling. I'm wondering how much you guys will rely on that territory for developmental purposes and what other territories you might look at to help develop young talent. I mean, I think I think at this day and age, I mean, it's almost passe to say look at a territory because there's there's so much cross pollination from area to area, and more so than ever, guys are getting out and working in different places, which I think is fantastic and something that I've encouraged for for all the years that I've been involved in, in training and developing talent. Uh, Florida City Wrestling is primarily, whether I'm involved with Impact or not, a company that we've always seen our prime purpose is giving an opportunity and a platform for young talent to come in and work in a TV environment, but when they get opportunities with Impact Wrestling or Ring of Honor or WWE or wherever it be. Um, so we like to develop them both as wrestlers and as television performers. So if there's somebody there that, uh, that can contribute, then we'll certainly look at having them here in the same context. If they're in Defy Wrestling in Seattle or if they're in uh, uh, FWS in Vegas or if they're... Uh, there was championship wrestling from Hollywood, or uh, I can rattle off 30 more names. If there's a talent out there that we think is a right fit for what we're doing, and there's a, there's a relationship to be had there that's mutually beneficial, then we're going to explore that. We will be out there looking for talent. It's important that we get talent uh, from all different areas in the U.S., from Canada, and as we live in a global and worldwide market, I think it's important that we get out there and we get uh, talent from all different areas of the world because, I mean, the days of uh, territorializing things, I think, are, are, uh, are, you know, somewhat behind us, and we have to understand that, uh, that, that everything 
not just the wrestling business, is, is now a worldwide scale. And uh, we need to go out there, and if we want to be a part of that market, we need to have, have competitors and performers that uh, represent what's out there in the world these days. Muted. Hi, gentlemen. It's uh, Dan from Total Wrestling Show over here in the UK. Uh, two quick kind of questions. I'm sure they are probably linked. Uh, one is the potential rumor of Rey Mysterio joining Impact Wrestling. I wonder if you can give us an update on that or anything you can say on that. And the other one, it's, it's a bit of an old, um, old question which comes up a lot on these conference calls, especially from the UK side, but is there any plan to do a UK tour again? Um, you know, I've, I've read a lot of rumors about different talents. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's the one you mentioned. Uh, I've read a bunch of stuff about Chris Jericho coming here, which if he is, it'd be nice if he would tell me since we've been friends for 25 years. Um, so, I, you know, I kind of don't put a lot of stock in, in rumors. I think, you know, people look at who's available out there, and then more importantly, I think fans look at who they'd like to see, and I totally get it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't typically put a ton of stock into rumors. In terms of the U.K. tour, uh, Scott could probably talk more to that. I mean, uh, I certainly have something I would like to do because I know the fans in the U.K. are super passionate about wrestling. And um, it's one of the places that I never got to go when I was an active wrestler. So. Uh, obviously, the UK has uh, been a huge market for this company historically, just like it's been a huge market for the wrestling business. Uh, you know, going back to the to the days of world of sport and all through uh, the UK's history and the revitalization over there on a on a homegrown and domestic level has been unbelievable over the last many years, and uh, we're excited and. Uh, and uh, really stoked here to, to be working with uh, and partnered with Spike UK. And part of it is getting our product out there in television variety. The other thing is obviously getting out there and engaging fans with live events. So I certainly think as we, as we move forward in 2018 and beyond, getting out there and, and getting in front of all those great UK fans is uh, certainly something that, uh, that, uh, that we want to do. And frankly, I think if any wrestling organization in the world truly wants to be a player, then uh, I think if they're looking to do that and not get out to the UK when it's such a hot market, then uh, they probably need to, to reevaluate their business then. Hi guys, it's Tony from Steel Chair again. Um, just had a quick question in regards to your partnership with um, AAA and NOAA. Is that still is that still an ongoing thing? Um, we have we have a, a open door policy as been discussed that we that we want to work with as many good and promotions out there that uh, they are when it makes sense to work with them. Uh, certainly, our partners that we established in 2017. Have uh, have been good to us, uh, as you can see. Uh, you know, uh, Ishimori is here in uh, in Orlando with us. He's our X division champion, and uh, we're excited to have a performer like that here. And uh, we also have uh, Phantasma here, who's uh, who's a great uh, lucha star. And uh, you know, we want to focus on bringing in great talent from uh, from around the world. And unlike uh, you know, historically in wrestling. If, uh, if there's a talent out there that we can work with or a promotion out there that we can work with, we're not going to get overly bogged down in what the initials are and what the history of it is. Uh, we really want to be collaborative with people to put out the best possible product. Good morning, Mr. Callis and Mr. Demore. This is Big Ray for OneWrestling.com. Thank you for spending some time with us here today. My question to you both is uh, aesthetics are a huge part of a TV show. And obviously you gentlemen are producing a, a TV show along with a sports entertainment event. Now, my question is, what are the things that are going to change in the look of Impact Wrestling for TV viewers? And are there going to be any changes? I think, I think we've asked this question a few times regarding the titles themselves. I've I've received some you know negative feedback regarding the look of the titles. It, it looks too much like GFW, or it's an Impact logo over the GFW title belt. Are there going to be any changes moving forward regarding the aesthetics of the show itself and the titles? Thank you for your time, gentlemen. 
Yeah, I think if you look at things, uh, as you, if, if you've uh, seen the, the ring uh, somehow got set up with two of the sides missing, so we think that's a bit of an aesthetic change. Uh, the, the ropes um, are a different color, I believe I noticed, and uh, I didn't see a lot of green in, uh, in any of our logos. So I think there's been some aesthetic changes we'll certainly consider to evaluate and, uh, and, and change that and evolve that as we go. And I hope everybody takes my, my comments tongue-in-cheek uh, as, the, as the, you know, light, uh, the light way that they're provided for a little levity here. Hard to tell when you guys can't laugh and put me over when I make a joke. Um, but, yeah, we'll certainly continue to evaluate the look. And we need to look for different looks and feels for the show. The show has uh, looked very similar for a lot of years, and we're going to get down to evaluating and trying some things, both location-wise and the looks of the, of the, the impact zone, wherever it may be, and how to, uh, to do things that look different and unique. We'll certainly be exploring that. Uh, we're not trying to mess with the, the core model of what wrestling is. And uh, the championship belt, obviously, uh, is something that everybody cares greatly about. And part of it is, guys, again, day 11, we needed to get in here and do things with these tapings coming up so quickly. Uh, there certainly will be new title belts for April uh, is our target. So by the time you see the, the, the next uh, event after what we, we have here, uh, in January, what we're doing, there will be uh, there will be new championship belts to uh, to reflect the uh, the changes in the company and try to uh, establish an identity going forward. Hello there, it's Francis Reyes from Ingring Pop. Uh, my question is one of the early questions about the UK um, tour. Um, have you got any plans, maybe in 2018 or 29, uh, for? Um, to maybe do impact tapings in the UK, for instance, and also, or maybe do something with World of Sports? I'm sorry, well, can you say the second part of that again? I'm saying, literally, would you, um, would, or would you be doing something with World of Sports, for instance, like doing like a, a show with them, if the opportunity arises? Well, I mean, I think, I think there's a couple of things. One, like we said, we certainly want to get out in, uh, in front of the U.K. Uh, fans in a, in a personal uh, setting, in a live event setting. Uh, doing television out of the U.K. would be, uh, would be fantastic uh, if, we can, uh, if we can get to uh, that point again. We've done it in the past, and it was, I think, quite successful. And uh, as for World of Sport, uh, uh, yeah. part of my heritage is uh, British and having an opportunity to have been over there and wrestled there and done the holiday camps and everything. Uh, I spent a lot of time watching, uh, watching old pal tapes of World of Sport, and I, I uniquely, and I think for a somewhat outsider, understand the significance culturally and historically of World of Sport, and uh, that's one of the things I was really excited about when there was the opportunity potentially to work, with, uh, to work, with, uh, work on the relaunch of, a world, of uh, world of Sport before. Um, disappointed it didn't happen, and if that opportunity ever comes up again in the future, and we can be a part of that and uh, work to make that a reality, <laughs> and we would, uh, I think we would, be, we would be very open and excited for an opportunity like that. But regardless of a world of sport opportunity, I think you'll certainly see an increased presence by impact in the UK market. Hi, it's Steve Herman from the Brothers Wrestling Podcast. If it's any consolation, first of all, Scott and Don, I did laugh at your jokes earlier on while I was on mute. But uh, two questions, if that's okay. Uh, first of all, very quickly, Austin Aries, how quickly did that uh, idea materialize and the storyline idea to put the belt on him straight away? And secondly, in terms of Britain, um, British Boot Camp was one of the old ideas from Impact TNA, which I thought was quite popular. You found Rockstar Spud and... Mark Andrews, would you be tempted to do a show like that again, or do you think it's just easier to cherry pick the bigger British talent pool that there is now? Um, and sorry, guys, and some of these, it, it, it's difficult to, uh, to hear on the connection we have here. But uh, I, I think your first part of the question was in reference to to Austin Aries. Uh, Austin yes. is a is, is a tremendous talent. Who has a long history with this with this company here, um, and certainly being able to to bring him back in the fold and get him in the in the mix is a great opportunity for us. Um, you know, 
he's at a place I think in his career where he's uh, he's hungry and he's got a mindset that I think uh, aligns with a lot of the things that we're looking to do here, which is to create a positive environment and uh, provide a platform for talent to collaborate. And so far, as this has developed over the, the many weeks of of, uh, of working through the logistics of having him return, it has been uh, it's been a wonderful process. It's been a very open, collaborative process, and uh, he's been uh, he's been a, a true class act and, and gentleman and professional. And uh, when individuals act like that, we're we're excited to to work with them. And when they have the type of uh, respect and notoriety that. Uh, that uh, Austin has in the industry, then uh, then we're even more excited. And then uh, certainly with Austin, there's always the the idea that uh, there's an unpredictability to him, and a little bit of that never hurt a product either. Second part of your question, I'll unfortunately have to ask you to repeat. Uh, no problem. It was in terms of searching for the the talent pool in britain um one of the previous things you did was the british boot camp tv show which worked very well and you found spud and, and mark andrews would you be tempted to do that again or because the talent pool in britain i'd argue is bigger now is it easier to just cherry pick who's there and bring them straight in well, I mean, I think there's, uh, I mean, it, it does, I don't know if it necessarily needs to be one or the other. There's a tremendous talent pool in the U.K. right now um, of, of uh, guys out there and, and girls that uh, certainly uh, deserve opportunities on a, on a broader scale. Uh, but with that said, that's still, I mean, one of the great things about British Boot Camp, I think, was the ability to get to, to see and understand and have a connection with these aspiring talents. And I think anything that does that is certainly... Uh, would never be something we'd take off the table from exploring. And uh, as you said, it proved to be a successful concept, both in the sense that it was well-received and, uh, and fans enjoyed it. And uh, also, that as you, as you stated, it found two tremendous talents that I think, uh, mm. that I think are very highly respected in the, uh, in the industry. So, uh, you know, it's certainly something we look at, especially as we look to expand our uh, ability to deliver content in multiple fashions and on multiple platforms. Uh, I would love to see a situation where we're doing things like uh, like uh, British Boot Camp and, you know, it would be great if we're out there doing things in, you know, Australia and China and India and all the other markets around the world. Um, so anything we can do that provides compelling uh, programming and, and viewing for our fans, and uh, anything that allows us to go out there and, uh, and grow in a global market, we're certainly, certainly very interested in. Hey, Scott and Don, it's Mike Johnson from PW Insider. Thanks for uh, joining us this morning. Um, obviously, there's a lot of a lot of work here and a lot of heavy lifting to be done. What are the biggest obstacles in your mind uh, when it comes to clearing away all the debris of what's come before and trying to repair the goodwill with the audience? Well, I think it's, um, it's almost like if I can use a sports analogy, you know, you, NFL, you hire a new coach and GM. I think you've got a short honeymoon period, and I think you have to make the most of that. And I think you have to not tell the fans uh, what you're going to do in, in the context of what you're asking, but you have to show them. So that goes from how you treat your talent to what you present as a product, how you treat the fans, and how you engage. And so I think that I haven't spent a lot of time looking at what happened before. Um, I've said before, I mean, I, I left here in 04 and really wasn't following the product. I, I think my goal in coming in and talking with Scott was Look, I, we don't care what has gone on here before in a negative sense. Let's focus on delivering the type of product um, that wrestling fans want to see, and let's make this place a, a destination uh, both for talent and fans. So less concerned about what happened before, and, and in, in fact, I, I don't really, I don't pay a ton of attention to that. We're really focused on kind of moving forward and, and making sure that we're, we're putting a product out there that are happy with. Yeah, just um, to follow up on uh, on Don's thing, I think the, the important thing is, I think there's been a lot of times in here where 
Uh, the idea has been to try to to shake things up, turn it around immediately, and that uh, that's an approach that, that that rarely works. I think the proven approach, uh, really in, in any type of business, uh, whether it be entertainment business, sports business, or whether it be whether it be running a construction company or a, or a coffee shop, is uh, there's a lot of little things that need to be done to lead to to better times. And it, it's not going to be one flash decision. It's not going to be one signing. It's not going to be um, it's not going to be you know one move that changes the world of impact wrestling. What it's going to be is a group of people getting up every morning and working very hard and diligently. To, uh, to grow this company. It's going to take a lot of small, smart decisions to, uh, to let this company be in a position to grow. And as Don touched on, the important thing is building trust. Trust has to be built with fans. The trust has to be built with wrestlers. The trust has to be built with other people out there in the wrestling industry. And uh, again, to echo Don's sentiments, you know, we can say it all we want, and I think people would love to see that happen. But it's, uh, as we sit here at the beginning of 2018, anyone that sits in the seat and says, hey, we're going to be better, we're going to treat people better, we're going to work better with other promotions, we're going to put on a product that fans can trust, there's going to be skepticism. You know? And what we need to do is to go out and do those things. We need to consistently put out a product that fans feel that they can get invested in and know that it's not going to pull the rug out from under them, and we need to treat our other promotions, partner or otherwise, and our talent, and everybody that we do business with in a proper business-like and professional manner. And we do those things. When we look back at the end of 2018, we're going to be in a very different position than we were than we are here at the start of 2018. And then at the end of 2019, I think we'll be looking at an even better position than we were at the end of 2018. So we're not looking to change the world overnight. We're looking to do this right do it once and build a foundation that can remain for years and years to be a strong, viable platform. Hi, BQ again from the Impact Lounge. Promotion at this point seems to be very limited to social media and the marketing, in my opinion, has had a lot of room for growth. Are there any ideas on how to enhance promotion and marketing tactics that will provide a greater reach and greater brand awareness? I, um, you know, in my part of my background in business school was um, was marketing and branding. But I can tell you this: that um, the best bet for any company in the entertainment industry is you first have to have the product. Um, you know, talk about show me, not tell me. Um, a lot of a lot of people spend a lot of money on advertising. The story is not accurate or the story is not true and it's not believable. Your input is invalid. That before we get into too much of that end of things, I think we have to show people and I think we If you'd like to ask a question, your request has been received. We're about what, what is the impact story and once we sort that out, then I think you can start to look at some of those marketing channels. But for now, I think we need to set the table. Uh, with talent and with the product we're offering, and, and create a create a buzz because you know the best media is earned media, not bought media. You know we want people we want fans on social media talking about what a hot product this is. And uh, if you look at you know the power I talked about in the hands on social media, um, we need to find better ways to leverage that. But in order to do that, we have to have a story to tell, and it can't be a story where people say we've heard this before. Um, like, yeah, these guys said they're going to do it, and then they did it, and that speaks to the trust that Scott talked about earlier. My question is this. You guys have mentioned about the coming and going of talent, but in the past there's also been discussions of having talent that's a core group of talent, a smaller group. Uh, who on the current roster, both male and female, would you identify as being some of that core talent that you'd like to keep for the next three to five years? Um, you know, and I think where that comes from is, is, you know, I've certainly talked about my booking influences 
among others being kind of on the one end of the spectrum, W, and then the other end of the spectrum, all Japan in the 90s. Um, and, and that kind of core group of you know six guys on top that all Japan kind of had um, that we would look to do wrestlers. Um, you know who those wrestlers are. I mean that that's that's a that's a process that is going to unfold. I think in the next few weeks on television. Um, and that that group is not not a set group. I mean we'd, we'd be foolish to have here's our six talents that we're we're going to build this around. And then, you know, a seventh or an eighth get over or come in, and we say, no, you're not going to be part of the six. I mean, I think we have to let some of that happen organically, and I also think it has to very much be an evergreen strategy where um, we have the ability um, to, um, to switch those talents in and out uh, as necessary. So I think it will be an iterative process, and, and we'll have to see how it unfolds. Now, Apple's changed that. Hello, uh, Ridhu from Sportskida. My question is, uh, there's been a lot of speculation that uh, during the recent round of people. Is there any quick to it? Um, sorry, uh, again, the connection here. Can you repeat the question a little more slowly here for our connection? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, there was uh, there was a lot of speculation that Moose was injured at the recent round of taping. Is there any truth to the same? Oh, uh, Moose tweaked his knee. We think he's being evaluated today, but we think he's going to be okay. You may now ask your question. Hey guys, <clears throat> Ryan Bowman from thegorillaposition.com again. Um, you guys are starting off a brand new year, a whole brand new, basically, company from scratch almost. And uh, uh, if you were having this teleconference 12 months from now, what is the greatest accomplishment or the biggest goal you hope to achieve in the calendar year of 2017 for Impact Wrestling? Well, hard. I think it would be hard to pick out one thing. Um, I think, you know... To, to just go really high level, I think we want to have a buzz about the product, um, you know, in the same way that if you look historically in wrestling, you know, what were the big buzzes that, that happened, you know, the, the Attitude Era, the Austin thing, the NWO. You look at what's going on right now with Kenny Omega worldwide and, and, and with New Japan. Um, we want to have a buzz about the product that is second to none because I think if, if you have the buzz, then that means you're you're reaching your customers and you're reaching your fans. So I think it's at the end of this year, if we're doing that, then a lot of those other pieces fall into place. Because if you've got the buzz, you're going to have excess revenue. If you've got the buzz, you're going to have goodwill with fans. If you've got the buzz, you're going to increase your, your merchandise sales. So I think that buzz, as innocuous as a term as that is, that is I think if we've got that, 11 months from now, we'll be in good shape. May I ask a follow-up to that? Muted. Oh. This is BQ again from the Impact Lounge. Very simple question because a lot of fans are very curious about this. Will we ever see another Impact Wrestling video game? Uh, certainly, we would uh, We would love to explore the, the opportunities out there to do, uh, do uh, an Impact Wrestling video game. Uh, and as we, we get out there and continue here in the 2018, I'm sure it's something that we'll, we'll look to try to tackle. Uh, you know, video games are a, a huge part of culture, as uh, you see out there. And you look at the, uh, the, the explosion, really, of Twitch, which uh, started, you know, in the gaming uh, universe. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, I think we'd be foolish to sit here and say that we don't want to have a video game that's going to go out there and explore opportunities. And when an opportunity presents itself that that makes sense, then uh, that we'd be foolish not to go down that road. All right, guys, we've gone one hour. I appreciate uh, both Scott and Don. Uh, we'll open it up for Don for a, uh, a final thought. Well, I just want to thank everyone for taking the time to talk to us. I mean, we want to be accessible to the media wherever we can. Uh, we recognize you guys have an important job to do. 
and want to help you to do it the best way we can. Uh, want to get the word out, of course, and uh, have an open door policy. I think I would just say to, to all the folks listening out there, um, Scott and Ed and I really want to uh, make this place somewhere that's a destination for fans and talent, and we thank you for helping us out with that. Yeah, and this is now the second uh, teleconference that I've done here, and uh, would like to say uh, that it's uh, it's always been appreciate how professional uh, you guys are on these calls, and everybody has been on these calls, and uh, we're uh, happy, as Don said, to have uh, some communication and some open communication. All of you guys, please blow up Ross Foreman's uh, phone and email as much as you can um, with those requests, and. Uh, we're excited, you know. Day day one in the studio, day uh, eleven in the uh, in the driver's seat for uh, Don, myself, and Ed, and uh, we look forward to things for 2018 and beyond. And uh, we look forward to your coverage, uh, you know, especially when you're positive up towards us. But even on those rare rare occasions where one of you seems to not agree with us, we'll uh, we'll take we'll take and uh, review both and understand, as Don said, the role you have to play. And guys, stay with us. Stay with us because uh, everybody loves a redemption story, and uh, Impact Wrestling is uh, is on its path to uh, establishing a solid foundation and growing on to being a very viable company. Party Media, I appreciate it. We will be back next week with another Impact Wrestling Media Teleconference. Q&A session is over. Your conference recording.